left, he was with the ANC, and he went to exile for 29 years. So I'm an exile baby. I was born in Zimbabwe. But all my siblings were born overseas, Germany, Austria, all over Africa. I have a lot of siblings, but I'm sort of the, the black sheep of the family. So all of them are educated, but my journey was different. So, so then when we came back to uh, South Africa in the 80s, we stayed in Attridgeville. But I had a huge identity crisis mm -hmm. because... We spoke English in my household because my mom was from a different country and my father was from a different country and he was in exile overseas for so long. Our first language was English. So after the power that my dad had, and he was such an intelligent man of high standards, uh, when he came back to exile, he lost all of that. And uh, I'm what you call a latlamiki. That's like, you know, the older, if you're like way older and then you still have children. So, so people used to say your grandfather's here, but it was yeah, actually my yeah, dad. Yeah. So with the older siblings, they grew up abroad, but the, little, the young ones, my dad was too old and he didn't have the power that he had. So after exile, we found ourselves living in a shack in Attridgeville mm. for three years. From that power, the domestic helpers, the gardeners, the big mansions traveling overseas, they had that lifestyle, my older siblings. But us, the younger ones, that was, that was what we... Your reality was poverty. Yes, yeah. extreme poverty. And back in the day, I don't know if you remember, they had like, in the townships, they had those four-roomed houses. Correct. Our poverty was so bad that we stayed in the shack, like way before Shongoville. So Kitsaniko Kabu in Atridgeville, Katsana Maga thing. And then my dad was like, Hey, the vernac is not vernacking. Let me try and send you to an Indian school. Okay. And I was one of the first black kids in that Indian school in Lodium in Andrew Anthony. Okay. So that was still fine until my dad, with his power, got us into C B D Pretoria. Okay. So we grew up in Sunnyside again. We were one of the first black people to grow up in Sunnyside. So when I tell you about the um, identity, it's, it's common sense. If people like to say, oh, when I eat bullet cool, oh, when I like, like the, the, the people love judging people a lot because of like how they carry themselves. So um, moved to Sunnyside and that's when the trauma started for me where I uh, got sexually abused, right, by a neighbor. Next door neighbor. Next door neighbor. And I was 11 years old. Do you remember how it started? Was it recurring or it happened once? That's the thing. You know, people usually talk about sexual abuse like, oh, I was sexually abused. But that's it. Your childhood been taken away. Imagine living an innocence of being a child and next thing, like some weird stuff is happening to you. Your childhood is getting taken away from you. Obviously, your mind is going to be completely different to what an innocent child is supposed to be. So it is serious. You pedophiles, you think you can get away with it. They will not get away with it. A lot of people have said to me, happy, why don't you go have that person arrested and stuff like that? There's nothing like God's wrath. So I'm telling you now, I know people casually say this. We were sexually abused or I, I was sexually abused. That's why I became like this. It is hectic when somebody does that to a child. Because as soon as the child leaves that place, I mean, there's these two white guys that's running around now on TV and they like killed the, their parents because, um, because that happened. When I was older, right, I wanted to go and also like, kill that person that did that to me. But because of Christ, I, I, I forgave that person. Forgiveness is a, is, is, is a huge thing. So um, how it happened is that they groom you, okay? So I was roller skating outside our yard, and, and then this gentleman came out. He could have been in his 40s. You're 11. He, I'm 11, right? So he came out and he offered me, like, he had, like, cake. And I mean, in our house, bro, there is no cake. They're like, the fridge is empty. There's just cabbage and there's pop one way, right? 
this African girl's going to see this like there's, there's, it's these greener pastures. I'm going to go. I'm going to accept that cake. It happened. They grew me. It happened like that for a long time. Then the next week he's inviting me to his crib. And then he's uh, putting cartoons on. So they pretend as though they're your father figure. Huh. I even went home and said, look, this is who I met. There's this uncle there. Nothing was said about it. So I was like, okay, it's all right to do this. And, um, and then the day that it happened, cartoons is normal cartoons. Now you're showing me pornography, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. Then he took the, because I was very tiny. Like, I was just, you could see. There was no ways you could take advantage of these 11 years. Sometimes I look at 11-year-olds and I'm like, happy, maybe you looked like matured and stuff like that. So I would look at, like, my, my daughter and I'm like, she's so innocent. Uh, like, I teach fragile. kids ministry. Yes, so fragile. They need protection. I'm like, huh? Because I try and think from the, uh, pedophiles, pers- like, like how they, how do you do that to try and do that to a kid? I hear you. I hear it's you. sick. It is sick. You are sick. You are sick, sick, sick. That's what you are. People need to stop that. Anyway, so then he um, got me on the bed, and that was the first time. Like, I didn't even watch like stuff like that on TV because my dad was super strict. Like, any kissing, you got to get out the house. Like, my dad was super strict. Got me on the bed, and then he did what he did. And then I had to go to school. Like, how on earth am I going to focus at school? And I was... Where is the morning just before school? Yes. No, 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 no. Um, The thing is, like, once that happens to you, I'm sorry to get so graphic. There's like an old person's smile that gets into your body. That's Mm. why people need to be very careful with this thing called sex that everyone's just giving it out like that. That stuff is spiritual. Huh. That stuff is spiritual. So when he did that to me, the next day you can just feel, huh. now how on earth are you going to concentrate in school? So I started failing. Did you understand what had happened to you? No. It's like you carry on. You, you carry on going to school. You don't understand it at all. Because once it's done, he takes you to the lounge and he puts on the cartoon and he acts like he's a father figure again. Back to the normality. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people always say, why don't, and people, you need to watch your mouth because you're not that child. Stop saying, why don't you go to a grown up? Because it's the weirdest thing, especially when you're in a fragile state, especially if you're looking for love, if you don't, like, if people come to you with this, with this, like, I'm here to protect you. And next thing they do that, you think it's part of that, like, huh. safety. This is part of the package of protection. Yes, this is how, like, this is how fathers are supposed to be. It's part of it. You just think it's part of it, you know? Um, so that happened, and I just started drop. I started failing. So I went to this forest, and it's six. I'm giving out my age. Yeah. Standard six, what's standard six? Grade eight. Grade eight, right? Yeah. I went as far as grade eight and um, I dropped out of school. Uh, and, I, well, I tried. I went to Lotus Gardens and, um, yeah, school wasn't for me. I was, just, I was just mad because the sexual abuse went for long until I turned 13 and I was sexually abused twice. 11 till 13? Yes. It, it, it happened. Mm-hmm. It kept on happening. Mm-hmm. By two different people. How it happened that it was two different people. I told my dad, dad, we got to get out of Sunnyside. I know we can't afford because we're staying in a mental institution called the Salvation Army. And that was like hardcore racists, right? So we were staying in the mental institution. And I said to my dad, we have to move to central Pretoria. There's a cheaper place that we can afford. And exactly the same thing happened to me. I got molested. Okay. So got molested, and I was like, the place that we moved at was very um, Schubert Park, Google Schubert Park. That place was hectic. It was, that's where your gangsters came out of, you know, and that's where me and my younger brother started dabbling in. We started hanging out with a lot of gangsters that was way older than what we were. Sorry to take you back. No worries. What age are you moving to Schubert Park? Um... 12, 13. 12, 13. Yeah, 12, so 13. So it's within that two-year yes. sp- span. Yes. Okay, so you move there mm-hmm. because 
you don't have the vocabulary uh, vocabulary as a child to articulate to your father that I'm not protected in this place. In fact, I'm being violated repeatedly. Mm. Um, but I'll say to you, let's move for other reasons. Yes. And, yes. and dad, like a good protector that he was trying to be, he listens and you guys do move. Not only that, bro, you be careful of like making a little child be responsible for adults' things. Huh. I had to take care of like, okay, we staying in this crap hole. Let's do something. Okay, my I need to get my family. Like, you know, I had to grow up quickly. Sure. So I knew through my friends, which was predominantly white. Like, try and picture this. I lived in a place where it was just solidly white people, mm -hmm. right? So we moving from like an English place that is sunny side to like an Afrikaans place, which is central, CBD of Pretoria. So then uh, my dad was like, okay. He didn't, I didn't think he thought about it. He just thought, okay, it's a better place. Let me pull my exile moves and try and get into that place. Because we couldn't afford it, my dad, but my dad somehow got it right. Sure. And then I got sexually abused by the neighbor again. Okay. And then that's when I thought, okay, that's it. Street life, thug life for me. How did that happen? Do you remember? The? Molestation. By the molestation. Neighbor. Same way. They groom you the same way. And you would think that I would say, so you're this thing now that I think about it. Imagine you're running away from your neighbor. You go to the, you, you're thinking you're going to a better place because you're trying to escape that pedophile. And then, so it, how many are these people really? Because why would it happen again with like a next door neighbor? And this guy wasn't even allowed to be in those flats she would park. So I think, because he was very successful, it didn't make sense. So I think somehow that's what was, because he, he, he had like five-star restaurants huh. and everything, but he had this like place and he had like this bed and this camera. So huh. obviously his domestic worker would go and get kids from the township and he would molest them there. Now that I'm older, I put one and one together. Yes. Trafficking kids from the township yeah. for a rich man yeah. who is influential yeah. by his domestic worker. For sure. Um, putting them in a flat in a low cost area because it's, you got it. it's unsuspected. There we go. Putting on a camera because he's so sick in the head. He yeah. wants to record this. You got it, brother. You got it. That's what, that's that. But for me, he didn't have to go to the township. Ah, she's right here. Right here. Sorry, I just want to echo. His racism exists in every other area besides when he wants to molest young kids. That's what I'm saying. And it happened to me so much that racism that you're talking about, right? They don't like blacks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So imagine. Okay, then anyway, so I was again playing outside and the cat came out. I love animals. So people that you'll see like... So I went to that cat and I was like playing with that cat. And he's like, again, nothing's like happy. Hello, this has been the same thing. I wish you could see how they groom you and why we get a lured in. I'm like a tough cookie. Like I, I told you, I'm an empath. We can see through people. It's weird how as a child, you just let that happen. I guess it, there is an emptiness that you just allow that to happen, mm -hmm. right? So then anyway, so he sexually abused me. And then at 13, when I became a teenager, I was like, wait a minute, this is wrong. This is wrong. And then I kind of like pulled away. Oh, and he was buying groceries for, for my family, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I grew older, there was a time without me like, guys, I have to say this. You know, I see now we're living in a world where I know I was like a bad girl growing up, right? But even this ex-bad girl, I'm like, yo, what the heck is happening in this world now, right? I see like a lot of shows where girls are giving their souls sexually and the parents are okay with it because you're bringing that bride pack into the house. Huh. You're going to answer to that. Be careful what you put a blind eye for in selling your child's soul. Huh. You understand? So parents are okay with whatever jobs people are doing out there that's like killing the soul. As long as we had that, that, that's where we are now. It's like crazy out there right now. I, I'm even like, yo, this is on another level. Anyway, so then I dropped out of school, got into gangsterism. Gangsterism at 13, 14. 13, 14, myself that, that's and my brother. Six, as you say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get into gangsterism? Well, these are guys from the, um, from the 70s. Like we used to hang around 40-year-olds, 30-year-old thugs. That came from like New Lock Prison and somehow they would go to Shubert Park Flats. And there was a level 
P level that the kids are supposed to play, but they couldn't play there because we took over, right? Even though I got involved with them, I didn't do what they did, but that was like family, you know? But I was so, I guess, so advanced that I would leave that, 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 that project flat and go to like your mainland, your, um, to, to look for job opportunities. So I always worked. That was, was weird. I always, always worked. So I didn't get into like that gangsterism that they did. I just, I just worked. And anyway, so then, so then I got, I started getting involved in drugs at the age of 11 and 12. And I was, I wore so many hats, like, it, it was a fast train because when I'm at Schubert Park, then I'm with the gangs, right? But I seem to like talk about just the gangs. There's so much craziness. I'm talking about gangs that stood. These guys were so crazy in the head that they'd walk around with X's in their pockets. They'd walk around with guns in their pockets. They were dark. All you see is like someone flying down, someone stabbing someone. Like that's, that's your lifestyle. It's like just violence all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have to go to work, and then work is in the upper class. So those are a lot of ravers, and that's the rave scene, that's the party scene. So I'm smoking mandrakes with these guys, and I'm always the only female there, right? I'm smoking mandrakes with them. I'm going to my work. I'm meeting all these upper class party girls. I'm going to the clubs with them, and I'm getting high on ecstasy. Hmm. So usually there's a break for people. Like people will be just only addicted to mandrakes or just drags and ecstasy. I was rotating in my lifestyle. So at home, I'm with the gangsters smoking mandrakes. Then I'm at work, going to the parties with the ravers. So it was clockwise of me doing drugs 24 hours. Were you a functional addict at that point? Yes. Mm. Yep. How, how does one become a functional addict? You... These drugs stop being effective? What's happening in your body and your brain at the time, if you reflect? Okay, so uh, you can't be a functional addict for too long. So for many, many years, I thought that I had it under control until I turned 23. Uh -huh. So my fellow black people, we have been through so much. We have, and I'm specifically saying my fellow black people, and we run to alcohol, we run to the clubs, we run, we run to so many things, like I did, right? And for the longest time, if you looked at me, you wouldn't say she takes drugs, right? Um, sorry, my throat. <coughs> Just have some water. No problem. Mm -hmm. I thought this wouldn't happen. So, and I've got braces, so it's quite a mission. So you wouldn't, if you looked at me, you wouldn't say that she takes drugs, okay? But when I turned 21, that's when I started using, um, um, what do you call it, crack cocaine. Huh. So everybody that's going to see this, they're going to say, happy, no, happy. You were like this cool party chick. There's no ways that you were, you worked, you had your own place, you had your own car. What are you talking about this life that you lived? When did this happen? So when I turned 21, the stuff that happened to me as a kid only started being traumatic for me. So the one day I left my boyfriend's place, I left my work, and I went straight to the streets and I became melancholy, like mad, for three years. So I didn't have control of the drugs anymore. What happened to me as a kid... And all those traumas that you were living every day, you think you're surviving, but it's building a character that is going to end up making you all Vesco yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I am. I sold my, I, I, I rented out my apartment. I gave my car to my younger brother who's doing well, who's a 